Good morning, everyone. My name is Deshay Coney. I am with the NCA Section Network um, as the Hethnet Coordinator. And today we're all uh, getting together to talk about Hep C and HIV testing trends in Western NC um, and how some of those testing trends seem to be overlooking people who need the testing and therefore uh, keeping people from getting the treatment um, and the cures that they need. So, um, which also affects funding, XYZ. But I'm not the expert, so I will not be going into that. But today we are joined by Hillary and Vanessa from Study Collective, um, all the way out in Asheville. So, um, and they'll be coming to talk to us about what they've noticed and some things that we can do, um, people we can talk to, methods that we can uh, look into to make sure that people are still getting tested and still getting covered and still getting treatment. But before we get into that, uh, I will pass it off to Lee, who has some announcements for us. Good morning, everybody. Um, just wanted to give a couple kind of updates about some things we have coming down the pike. Um, as you all know, you know, these Thursday morning webinars have become a bit of a tradition for us in the time of COVID. Um, I, you know, as we're entering this new period, trying to be really intentional about sort of some of the best content and things that we've got going on. Um, do want to just alert you to mark your calendar for two weeks from today on October 1st at 10 a.m. is going to be our next webinar and we're focusing on some changes that have been made to the HIV medication assistance program this year. Um, HMAP, as folks know, is our state's AIDS drug assistance program and state DHHS recently released some restrictions on that program about who could enroll in the premium assistance component of that program. Currently in North Carolina, only folks who fall within certain income brackets are able to purchase free health insurance through that program. And starting during open enrollment this year, anyone who is eligible for the program and a United States resident will be eligible which is really thrilling news. It's really fantastic. It's advocacy work many of us done for a long time. So we're gonna be focusing in on that change and really ramping up our public education on that effort in October and hope y'all will join us on October 1st for a pretty important conversation and overview of what the change means. And then the second thing we just wanted to alert folks to is that we are gonna be opening today registration for our annual advocacy conference. Um, many of y'all have been able to attend in person before Building Power Across the Spectrum, our annual HIV and Hepatitis Advocacy Conference. Of course, with the world the way it is this year, we are moving that to a virtual conversation and have some exciting plans we're thinking about. Um, we're going to be hosting that online the afternoon of Friday, November 13th and the morning of Saturday, November 14th. So be on the lookout for us for a registration link. Um, you know, we all, I think, are trying to think about the best ways to keep up this engagement and keep up this public education with everything going on right now. Um, and are excited to still think about some ways we can all still come together as a community. So with that being said, um, I will pass things off to Shay to kick off our presentation. <clears throat> So yes, please make sure that you have your calendars marked and dated, both online and written, as I am learning to do so myself. So <laughs> let's go ahead and get started. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, enter them into the chat. Um, I will definitely be monitoring and looking at that and asking questions as we go. Um, otherwise, I can also save them for the end. Um, so if you're a little nervous about asking, you can just send me a direct message and I'll ask myself. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and get started and I will pass it off to Hillary so we can go ahead and start talking about testing it for Hep C and HIV in Western NC. Oh, you might still be muted. There you go. Thanks so much, Jay. Um, I'm Hill Brown, the co-director of Study Collective. Um, Study Collective is a harm reduction organization that uh, began in 2016 in West North Carolina. We serve folks in Asheville, Buncombe County. Um, and so we're going to, Vanessa, uh, the other director of Study Collective, is also on this call, and we're going to together be talking about sort of some testing gaps that have appeared in Western North Carolina. Um, there is a lack of access to testing and also the testing that's available um, appears to, uh, well, sometimes it always doesn't, it doesn't appear that accessible. So 
we want to sort of address those things and, and talk about what the gaps are there and, and maybe some alternatives and ways to move forward now that we sort of know what the problems are. And I don't know if y'all can see the slideshow. I think Deshay's working on it. Shay or Hill, which of y'all is sharing slides? We need to make y'all a co-host if you are. I think Deshay is sharing them. Okay. And I can share them, let's see. Shay, I just made you a co-host, which should let you share your screen. Sorry about that. Okay. Ooh. Ooh. We're coming, we're coming. There we go. Okay. Okay, there we go. Ah. So, share screen. Share content screen. Okay. Okay, can everyone see? There we go. Okay, interesting, interesting. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay. So uh, here we are at the beginning and um, the starting slide, sort of the name of this is a little bit deceptive because um, I feel like a lot of the issues that are happening in Western North Carolina are not uh, in C as a whole. Right, so this is trial by numbers in NC, um, but Western North Carolina does have sort of particular issues uh, with testing and with access to medical care um, and different sort of risk factors for folks. Um, so we are gonna be talking mostly about Western North Carolina. This is a little map on the, on the side of the screen. If, oh, my voice is staticky. Are y'all, is everybody? hearing me okay? Okay. Um, maybe a little closer, little, that will help. It's a little staticky. Um, we it's can a little staticky. Hear you, but it's a little okay. crispy in and out. Okay. Is this, I'm gonna move this slightly. Maybe that will help. Um, Okay, y'all let me know if it continues to be an issue. So um, acute rates of hep C in North Carolina, one in eight or 100,000, which is higher than the national average. Um, and then acute rates of hep C in West North Carolina is 10 in 100,000. And we don't have chronic rates here um, because county-based chronic hep C reporting was voluntary until very recently. So it was very hard to get those numbers. That's um, difficult for us. Uh oh, it's first now. Let's see. Um, how about my voice now? Yeah. Okay. Not sure either. It's better. Hmm. Better. Okay. All right. Um. So, good, yes, okay, good. Um, so, uh, we, at SETI Collective, we're seeing a lot of folks who have chronic hep C, right? So, um, those are the numbers that we really need. And later in this presentation, we're gonna talk about um, how things are different in Eastern Tennessee and how they have um, sort of a better feel on chronic hep C numbers. Um, so, uh, yikes. We, this voice thing may continue to be a problem, y'all. I'm sorry. Um, I'm not sure what to do. Yikes. You know, this is this is the fun and the joy of, of leaning into the new world of technology, right, for all of us. So, Hill, maybe, <laughs> just, I think we can mostly get the content. If you just want to sort of power through the next bit and maybe, like, try to reset and before passing it to Vanessa, that's my only technological suggestion. But I have no tech 
offerings I can provide for this. Okay, I don't have a headset, so I apologize, but it's usually not an issue. Maybe this rain. Um, I also can maybe try to move uh, to like a different part of the house. Um, so uh, the HIV rates um, in NC, we're looking at 12.8 and 100,000 HIV rates in WNC, again, very hard to measure. Um, so, and we'll talk about why later. Uh, and Buncombe County consistently has one of the highest overdose rates in NC. Is my voice sounding better to y'all? Still staticky. I actually think this is the best it's been. Um, yeah. So <laughs> okay. Maybe turning off your video was the, was the just... key. Was it? Okay, I'm also standing over the kitchen sink, so this may not be like a sustainable solution here. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll just continue to talk. Um, okay, and so the reason that it's noted at the bottom here that Buncombe County has a really high overdose rate is to say that um, these numbers and this testing is particularly important because we know that we have a lot of folks using drugs in this area um, and using IV drugs. Um, which is a risk factor for HCV and HIV. And we can move to the next slide. So getting a test in Western North Carolina, there are sort of three accessible places to be tested for folks that are being served by organizations like Study Collective. And Study Collective is a syringe exchange and harm reduction program that is mostly serving homeless and precariously housed people living in Buncombe County with little or no access to transportation. Um, Buncombe County is in Region 2, and, and we'll start discussing that in a minute. Um, and Region 2 sort of fancies itself as an urban area, but it has a lot of rural problems. Um, we have very uh, poor transportation service. Our, our bus system is not very good in Buncombe County. Um, it doesn't run around the clock and a lot of people can't pay for it. So there's been a lot of advocacy to make transportation, the bus system more accessible here and it's just really not. So we have the same transportation issues as a lot of rural areas. We have more people here. Um, and unfortunately, the sort of the three places you would get tested haven't really kept up with sort of the volume of people that need to be served. Um, so the, the places that people would get a test here for free would be the county health department, the local aid service organization, um, and Mission Hospital. And I debated on whether to say getting a test in WNC or getting a test in Asheville, but actually these services are kind of the same for the whole region. And there are county health departments across the region that would be a resource for people. Um, the aid service organization that's based in Asheville serves most of the region, actually, and, and we'll get into why that's sort of an issue. And then Mission Hospital is huge. It's a very large hospital system that's been purchased by Hospital Corporation of America. Um, and it serves basically the whole region. So you, you have sort of these three re resources throughout Western North Carolina. And we can go to the next slide. So we're going to start with the discussion about the county health departments. And um, when we sort of jump into the next slide, um, we'll talk about some other resources, but also Vanessa feel free to like add here uh, on the county health department conversation. So um, the county health department here um, is situated in region two and um, region two in some research, if we kind of scroll up just a little bit. Sorry. Keep going, keep going. It's okay, it's okay, it's the big slide. Um, at the bottom, it's we note that what you're sort of seeing here um, is from research that Dr. Bela Ostrak is doing, um, who is the community research liaison for SETI Collective. Um, and this is information from a paper that's in progress about uh, county health departments and testing for HCV and HIV. So Asheville is situated in region two. 
um, and, and folks in region two um, who work in county health departments did say that they're not testing everybody they could for HCV. Um, and that's not about funding. They named that even you know, with the funding they have, they're not getting to all the people they need to get to. And some of that is about transportation on the end of the folks who would be trying to get testing. And some of it is about like the county health department sort of not knowing where to go in the community to do testing days or not having the relationship with the community to be able to do effective testing days out in the community. Um, health department staff in region two noted that they were only offering HIV tests to people who were in high risk groups. So we don't have any sort of universal testing for HCV and HIV out here. Um, they're not testing all the folks they need to for HCV and they're only testing people they perceive to be high risk for HIV. Um, and they used very stigmatizing language to talk about people they believe to be in those high risk groups saying things like, people are choosing drugs over health, which is sort of a common refrain about people who use drugs, that they don't value their health. And um, sort of that's why they're in the situation they're in. Um, so there was sort of that comment, which is very disturbing. And then if you'll scroll down just a little bit, Deshay. Like right away. And there's an increase. Yeah, yeah. And it gets a little bit cut off here. Um, but there's an increase in HIV among the gay community due to promiscuity. So that also showed up in the research, um, folks in region two saying that. And so, and somebody's asking about, um, partnering with advocates in the community to get testing done and study collective has made that attempt to sort of partner with the health department. And I will let, Vanessa talk a little more about that because she's been working on that recently. Um, but I think one barrier in addition to these, um, yeah, and and Dr. Ostrak is on here and said that these are direct quotes from health department staff. Um, so these are just not, they're not just thoughts. These are things that health department staff actually said about the people they, they should be testing or should be offering tests to. And Another barrier here is that none of these health departments in the West are doing confirmatory testing. So, you know, you go to a health department and you're basically getting a rapid and then they are, they do not have the capacity to do a confirmatory test with you. And that's a huge barrier because if you can't get a confirmatory test, then you cannot receive treatment. And if we're serving mostly folks who are not insured and don't have transportation or, and are maybe not even housed, then having to make additional trips to get those labs done and figure out the funding for that is complicated. Um, so it's, to me, it feels strange that the county health department is not attempting to sort of close that gap and offer low barrier care by also doing confirmatory tests because really all that's needed there um, is for a person to be phlebotomy trained, right? To be able to do that there and be able to run the labs. Right now, all of their labs are being sent to the state um, even, even though they're not doing confirmatory testing, their other labs are being sent to the state for processing. And Vanessa, do you have anything you want to add here on this? Sure. Um, so I, I met with, um, I, I don't know if Hill said this, um, not that I was not listening to you, um, but I, I am a registered <laughs> nurse in addition to working at study. And so, um, I met, I have the capacity, full capacity to draw labs and, and offer a lot more services to our participants. Um, but it would require a standing order for me to do so. So I partnered with the county or attempted to partner with the county. Um, I had a meeting either in late February or the first week of March, um, and talked with the county health a nurse there about, um, us just me drawing blood at study, bringing it to the county and having them run um, that blood so that our folks could get confirmatory testing and kind of talked about the barriers that going into the county health department creates for folks. Um, they have to pass by a cop to get into the building um, and then they get a rapid screen and 
I guess the, if the rapid comes back, the way it was explained to me is that if the rapid comes back positive, then they send them for confirmatory testing. So then we have to convince this person to be there twice. Um, they want folks to wait around for the rapid to come back. Um, I feel like anyone who works particularly with people who do stimulants, like to ask them to sit in a chair and wait for 20 minutes is often just a ludicrous ask of people like that. Um, so there's just all these things that told me how out of touch they are with folks who do drugs. And I tried to sell them on the fact that, you know, I have relationships with these people. Uh, I have built trust with people. And if they could just drop in and on a day that they were ready to get tested with me and say, hey, Vanessa, can you test me today? And I could go get the things and do the test instead of saying, get in my car and come to the county or whatever, um, that we're more likely to actually be testing people. Um, this nurse seemed pretty on board with the idea. Um, two days after we met, she sent me an email and was like, oh, the county's switching over to COVID stuff. Um, this is just not going to happen. Um, and I feel like that's kind of maybe an excuse. Like life goes on for our folks. They continue to be at risk. Um, and, and just because COVID exists in this community and, you know, global society doesn't change the fact that like our folks need testing. So I felt like just pretty written off um, by the county at that point. Yeah, thank you, Vanessa. And I think um, that, yes, and as Wanda's noting here, our folks are also at risk for COVID. And I think that that has been an issue too, is trying to get testing. And so I think the issue for testing for HCV and testing for HIV also carries over to COVID. And the management of, da of data around COVID um, is also not handled well, right? So we've We've seen a poor access to testing in Buncombe County, um, which is concerning. Asheville is a tourist town. Um, we have huge influx of people. Um, and so lots of exposure or possible exposure to people flying into to our area. And um, there was a period of time from late March to early April, about two weeks, where the county did about 30 tests a day. And that was it. So we saw just, a, you know, not prioritizing testing for folks. And so then the numbers stay artificially low. And, and it's my belief that a lot of this, um, the low numbers that we have in this region are about supporting tourism and sort of living with the idea that um, nothing's going on out here. And so tourism and sort of entertainment and, and the running of a resort town can go as it's always gone without any disruption and, and without noting that we have major public health issues in this region of the state. So yes, our folks are being affected by COVID and our folks unfortunately are not um, receiving appropriate access to testing um, on that front either. Anything else about this County Health Department piece? I do wanna say also, it's clear from these quotes that the staff in Region 2 are also not clear about um, like who is actually at risk for HCV and HIV. Um, this is not, you know, keeping in line with sort of CDC guidelines about who's at risk. Um, and that's something that Bela Ostrak notes um, in this paper in progress is that, you know, they aren't even keeping up to date with who they should be testing and who is at risk of these things. We can go to the next slide. So um, the other place that folks could get tested for free is um, the aid service organization in town. And the local aid service organization serves an entire largely rural area of North Carolina, um, not just Asheville or Buncombe County. So Buncombe County is very large and they are tasked with serving many more counties um, and they're just based 
in Asheville. They've, they've opened another office farther out west, but um, they are tasked with a very large area um, in a region of the country um, that has a very high uh, rate of new HIV cases being diagnosed and also um, of people not knowing their status. They have a large region to cover. Um, when reporting data, this organization frequently doesn't make distinctions between unique participants and total visits. If you could scroll down just a bit there, Dishay. Um, and we're kind of getting cutting off here, but an example, you know, if 900 tests are done, are they done on 900 individual people or were 900 tests done on 300 people three times in the course of a year, right? So sometimes the data comes out, we're not clear on that distinction. So they're having to cover just a lot. Um, and and the, the reporting, I think, is overwhelming. And so we're not getting great data out from, from that organization. They also do not do um, confirmatory testing for HCV there. Um, they have the ability to do labs. They do have phlebotomy stain, trained staff, but they don't, um, they can't do labs on site. So they are not doing confirmatory testing either. And this confirmatory testing for HCV is is again a huge piece because it creates another barrier for folks um, because they have to get those follow-up labs. And in the case of the County Health Department and this aid service organization, they also have syringe exchanges on site. Um, and harm reduction organizations are tasked with not just doing syringe exchange, but actually engaging in sort of a larger philosophy, which is low barrier care. So, you know, one way that we eliminate barriers is by having everything in one place. And Steady Collective is the smallest syringe exchange in Buncombe County um, and sort of the least resourced one. So we have sort of the least capacity at Steady Collective, even though Vanessa and I are there, to, to serve all the needs in one space. And it would be great if the County Health Department or the State Service Organization sort of were we're able to wrap all of those things in. And we're trying as best we can to like move towards doing more testing, but um, yeah, there, there are two other exchanges um, and it would be helpful if, if they you know, had the capacity to do these things for sure. Any questions about sort of that? Oh, I had a question. Yes, if we could have safe sites. Yeah, uh-huh. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I can't, I can't see the screen, so I don't know if anyone was asking questions. Um, but I was wondering, because I know you mentioned that you're doing low barrier care. Um, it sounds like transportation stigma are still two of those barriers that are kind of hard to, to get around in, um, for some organizations. What are uh, some other barriers that um, would be considered uh, a low barrier? What else would be like low barrier care? Mm -hmm. I think uh, evidence shows that when people who use drugs are offered drop-in care where there are no requirements for appointments, um, they can just show up and, and um, see someone, that that's like the best way to get people who use drugs connected to care is <laughs> to literally drop the bar so far that, um, that they don't have to make an appointment. If they show up and, and somebody is there to see them, they get seen. Um, and then there's the, the piece that when I'm providing, even with wound care and things like that, I don't ask for anyone's name. So a lot of times when we go move into this, like, is it syringe exchange or is it a clinic? Is it harm reduction or is it medical care? You know, this like weird gray area is when they start to ask people for more identifying information. Um, and so even when I'm providing what a lot of folks would call medical care to people, I still don't ask for that information. If someone volunteers it to me, sure. But when I'm taking my notes about people, all that, I use identifiers of other sorts um, so that I know who they are and they could look at my notes and say, yeah, that's me. But if someone you know, read that note, they don't know who that person is and they didn't feel like obligated to divulge to me their legal name or anything like that. Yeah, and and Bay Bela Ostrak is noting that like not having police present 
is also like an elimination of a barrier. And I think that unfortunately, what we're sort of seeing throughout the region, and I don't think this is re regionally specific, is that we see so much collaboration between law enforcement um, and, and the medical industrial complex, right? So we're, we're having the, that major crossover and the folks that we work with are engaged in a criminalized behavior and they are used to being treated like criminals everywhere. Um, not like people seeking care. So, you know, part of the stigma that drug users don't care about their health, that's not true. They just don't want to go into spaces. Um, also not asking about warrants. Yeah. Um, you know, part of the deal is like, they don't want to go into a space where um, they are going to be treated like a criminal instead of a patient. And I think that we just continue to have spaces that are not taking that into consideration. The county health department being guarded by multiple sheriff's deputies is a barrier for folks accessing syringe exchange there. It's a barrier for folks accessing care there. It's also um, where, you know, folks lose their kids, lose access to their kids. That's happening in the same building. So we've got to think a little more about um, the care that folks are being offered and where it's being offered um, and how folks even enter those buildings. Like that's part of, part of the thought. Returning to the aid service organization, I'll also say that this um, service organization uh, is in a sort of an area of town that doesn't get a lot of foot traffic. It is on a bus line, but it's not in, a down, in the downtown area or in West Asheville. So it's a little bit removed. It's been in the same location for a long time. And the, the testing they are doing in the community um, is a sort of scattered site testing that's done at the invitation of other organizations or events. So it's not super systematic. So, um, you know, maybe they'll go to one location um, multiple times in a year, maybe they'll go once a month. Um, and so they are, you know, retesting folks um, who they haven't seen in a little while. Um, but sometimes they're only testing people once or whatever, and there's not a lot of continuity of care. Um, so that that is also part of sort of the data piece here is like, we're not doing systematic testing out in the community. We can go to the next slide. So um, I'm gonna let Vanessa mostly talk about, about Mission Hospital here. And when I say that folks have access to testing here, I do wanna note that I mean like going through the ED. That's how our folks would get any testing there. It's not like they would have an appointment there. Um, but, you know, they would go through the ED for some other kind of care um, and then they maybe be offered a test. And, and I'll let Vanessa sort of hop on that and, and talk more about mission. Um, so I, I previously worked um, in the ED at mission prior to coming to study full time. Um, and I think that whether someone is offered a test or not is largely dependent on who the practitioner is who's caring for them, um, which is unfortunate because um, protocols exist um, in the way that we care for many, many patients. And my belief is that if they're going to use this protocol, which they call the IVDA protocol, which is um, a protocol that strips people who use drugs of like certain what they refer to as privileges. Um, so for example, if you come in and you have a positive dr drug screen, um, you're not allowed to have your phone, you're not allowed to wear your own clothing. Um, we strip search those folks. Um, it's incredibly dehumanizing. So we have this protocol, I say we, I'm not, I'm not we anymore, <laughs> thank God. Um, but they have this protocol that treats people who use drugs in a very specific way, but they don't have any protocols about offering those people testing while they're there. So recently, um, I a participant came who had an abscess that they wanted treated um, that I could not treat. I took this person to the ED. They were there for almost six hours. They got the um, they got a full panel of labs drawn. Um, and they got the abscess treated and they were discharged. Um, when I went to pick this person up, um, we had a conversation about the experience and they said, you know, they gave me a printout of my labs and there's a couple of labs on there that say hi. Um, the value says hi. 
and I don't really know what that means. And would you look at them? And so this person handed me their entire like medical record essentially um, from that evening. And <clears throat> the person had disclosed that they used drugs um, during the visit. So that was, it was noted in the, in the um, notes from, from that visit. So the person had disclosed to their provider um, that they were using IV drugs. The three labs that were values that were high values were two liver functions, um, which we know that hep C affects the liver, and then um, a lab called serum protein, which um, when seen in combination with um, elevated liver enzymes, a serum protein, an elevated serum protein is an indication that there is inflammation or infection in the body. And that's something that every nurse should know, and it is certainly something that every MD should know. Um, so I glanced at these labs and like my stomach dropped because I thought, gosh, this person probably has hep C. Um, and then it put me in a position where I'm, I'm interpreting labs that I did not draw, um, which is not something I should be doing. Um, and had to say to this person, hey, have you been tested for hep C? And long story short, this person is positive. Um, so I don't know who dropped the ball that day. Um, the nurse who, you know, when I was caring for patients in that ED, it was my responsibility to look at labs. And so doctors are assigned sometimes 15 or more patients at once, whereas nurses see three to four. So it was my responsibility to look at labs. And if I saw something that seemed out of order for me to make sure that the MD took note of that. So I don't know if the nurse caught it. I don't know if the nurse didn't catch it or, you know, or if the MD just ignored it. But when you see someone who is in a high risk group, who has a lab that's sort of a nuanced suggestion that they might have hep C and they were not offered a test is a failure. Um, they failed her, this person. So I know that that's not the only person this has happened to. Um, I will also say that um, I was treating a patient inpatient who was there for many, many weeks, um, who finally got hep C testing because I became so annoying um, that it got done. And this person was on this IVDA protocol, got so fed up with the protocol that they left AMA prior to the results coming back. And that person was positive as well, but never got those results because if you leave AMA, they don't call you. They don't call you to tell you your results. And I think, you know, part of what is frustrating about this and and Vanessa is noting that people are leaving against medical advice and sort of the last data taken on that is that 26% of the people put on this IBDA protocol leave against medical advice. So it's a huge swath of people that are leaving before their treatment is completed, but they're treated with such disrespect that there's no reason they would stay anyway. I wouldn't stay if I wasn't allowed to have my own clothes and I couldn't have a phone and I wasn't allowed to have visitors and I couldn't have a room phone and I couldn't have flowers delivered and all these things that are like being incarcerated when you're also feeling incredibly sick. You're there for, for medical care. Um, so again, when drug users reach out and do prior prioritize their health, they're also punished in that setting. So you know, we're seeing that, and then we're seeing people put on this protocol, which is very punitive, but then there's none of the, like, nothing comes with that, right? So if you're saying that a person is a drug user, and, um, and you're going to think about that during their medical care, it doesn't really seem like they are thinking about it, because this is a high-risk group, you should offer these tests, um, there should be, I don't know, some, something positive about identifying that this person is at, at a greater risk for certain conditions and offering people tests based on that. And that has not happened at mission. And we, we know that if the attitudes at the county health department in region two are saying, 
what people are saying, what they're saying there and have these stigmatizing attitudes, that's going to carry over to mission as well. You know, these nurses go back, back and forth between these two medical providers. So the attitudes we're seeing in region two health departments carry over to region two hospitals. So we've got these two places where people could access tests just with tons of stigma um, towards people who are using drugs, people who are at very high risk for HCV and HIV. Um, and then at the bottom, I do note on the slide that one of the most frequently performed surgeries at Mission is a valve replacement surgery related to endocarditis. And endocarditis um, is an infection of the heart lining that is the result of usually the result of using non-sterile injecting equipment. Um, and so what that proves is we've got a lot of folks who are injecting drugs um, and who are at a very high risk. And Mission knows that because they're treating all this endo infection and endocarditis. They're doing all this endocarditis surgeries. We can go to the next slide. So I wanted to talk briefly about sort of just outside this region, um, what's happening and how things could be different um, with some more support from the state and some better training. Um, and some prioritizing of services that, that know how to interact with people who are using drugs. So in Knoxville, Choice Health Network is a harm reduction organization, the syringe exchange, that's been supported by the state to provide testing and they confirmed 289 chronic and 141 acute cases of hep C last year. Um, so that feels pretty huge. Um, and they were able to do that because the state gave them test to do it because the state understood this is important and we need to test people and we need to figure out how to treat those people too, right? So they not only tested people for HCV, they also helped get all of those people into treatment. Um, and then if you scroll down a little bit on this slide, um, they, oh, uh, got cut off there, but they also, um, saw a spike in HIV amongst their participants last year, and they are testing regularly all of their regular participants because they have the capacity to do that. Um, and they do have a nurse on site at the syringe exchange, and they are going to multiple places in the community. They did, did see a spike in HIV last year, and now all of those folks who tested positive for HIV have been um, moved into treatment and they're all undetectable now. So this is a huge win um, at this community-based syringe exchange. And it's just wild to me because Knoxville is about two hours from Asheville. So if we can look at Tennessee where we actually have some, some decent data from this organization and we have the state sort of supporting their work, um, then we know that two hours away in Asheville, we have these same issues. They're just not being addressed, right? A two hour difference is nothing. And we know that people are um, coming and going from Asheville to Knoxville all the time. And so, you know, we need to be acting like these are our issues too and approach it with at least as much support as they're getting in Eastern Tennessee, right? The issues in Eastern Tennessee are the, are the issues in Western North Carolina. It's sort of one in the same. Is there anything you want to say about that, Vanessa? Um, not particularly. You know, it it it's frustrating, I guess, um, to to not have support from the county and the state, and to to have a resource of a nurse. Um, we're the only exchange that has a dedicated nurse, and for that like skill set to be not utilized to the fullest of my scope of practice feels like a detriment to this community. Um, and it's interesting to me how Tennessee has gotten it for some reason. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what's different. Um, yeah, it, it does feel like very confusing <laughs> that Eastern Tennessee, which is like 
very rural and is often talked about as like not having many resources has figured this out. But I guess that this also speaks to sort of the region one, region two thing that Dr. Ostrak has pointed out here is that like people in rural areas like are sort of admitting the issues they have and they're having to figure out the resources available to them and how to get people into the services. And, and Asheville is like a little removed from that and sort of really is deluding itself into believing that it doesn't have these problems. And the numbers in Knoxville, this 289 chronic, 141 acute, like it shows why we need the chronic numbers because the chronic numbers are much higher in the, in the population we're serving than these acute cases, right? We're seeing people that, you know, have had hep C for many years um, and have avoided treatment for sort of the reasons that we've laid out here, you know, stigma, um, lack of access to insurance. We, you know, didn't expand Medicaid. So we're, we're still sort of dealing with those issues. Um, and, and they've received a lot of information about they're going to have to stop injecting. They're going to have to be totally abstinent before they can receive care here. And clearly that's not happening in Eastern Tennessee. Folks are, are getting into treatment. And here we definitely have providers in Western North Carolina that will treat people, um, even if they don't stop injecting. But you know, if they went to get treatment several years ago, that's not what they heard. And, and the education has not been done with folks that needs to be done to say, hey, we're done with that. We've moved on and we're changing the way we treat hep C. There's just not been good education on the ground. Um, and that is really the responsibility of county health departments, hospital systems, um, primary care doctors to, to be doing that education. So folks know that now is a time when they can get treated and it's it's quick and it could be paid for and, and all of those things. Are there questions that we can answer for folks? Okay, so I see a question in the chat. I'm sorry, I haven't been able to look at the chat. <laughs> um, but one is, uh, which providers in Western North Carolina will and won't treat HCV um, in active use um, as they're supposed to uh, could be a whole other discussion. Um, so like, you know, uh, people who may still currently be using, um, who are denied treatment because they're currently using, they're saying, well, we, we don't want to uh, treat you because you might be become reinfected. Um, well, yeah, so uh, who, which providers in West North Carolina um, will still treat, or, or will and won't treat for um, HCV because of active use? I, yeah, go ahead, I heard Vanessa. Yes, yesterday from a, a caseworker who said that, um, so there's sort of two primary care providers in town who work with people who have no insurance or um, no Medicaid. Um, and so this caseworker had a patient who was getting um, hep C treatment, but was injecting their prescribed Suboxone. And the provider had a problem with that and would not continue to treat them. So they took the caseworker took that client to the other primary care provider who was within their ability to get treated um, like for free. And that provider would not treat them because they were connected to primary care at the place who would not treat them. So this person didn't get treated, I guess is what I'm saying. So. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we, um, I mean, I don't have video, so I'm not static here, but um, we run into that a lot. And I think it's one of the hardest parts of our work is, you know, providers say they'll do something and then the person gets there and they won't do it. So it's kind of like, I, I often say that there's no such thing as a warm handoff in Nashville. You like literally have to go and be sitting with the person and advocate on their behalf, um, like there, 
you have to be there. Um, and that makes our work very difficult. There's not a lot of consistency in, um, in all of this. Uh, basically, there don't seem to be protocols, right? There, there will be a provider that says they treat everybody even if they're using, and then all of a sudden, you know, a person won't get treated there and we can't figure out why. So I think that that is a hard thing. And somebody asked if this is being recorded so WinCap employees can see it, and, and it is being recorded as far as I know. I think the recording button is on. And I should say that, you know, this isn't an attempt to like be a drag on WinCap. I think WinCap is in a position where it is legitimately just hard to meet the need based on the resources that they're being provided, right, for testing. And we are, um, you know, also struggling to figure out the testing piece in Western North Carolina because we just are not receiving appropriate resources. And I think that, yeah, the, te the testing piece is very hard out here. Yeah, I, um, after, after hearing, uh, after hearing and seeing the slides, um, it is, it is really interesting how we are looking at barriers and finding ways to eliminate big barriers and then the little, little barriers show up and they're bigger than we thought they'd be. Um, especially when it comes to things like going into the emergency department and, and getting a whole bunch of other tests that are related to a test that you need um, and not knowing how to read your own medical chart. Like it's kind of hard to want to go out to the community and be like, yeah, so here's some things that you should look for on your medical chart even though you're not a medical professional and have no medical background. Um, it's putting a lot of pressure into the hands of the people to be like, well, you've got to have really strong self-efficacy. It's kind of hard to have strong um, self-efficacy when I'm doing so many other things. And I do, I do find this to be important, but I don't have the time to research every small detail. And I, I do need help with that. And that is the purpose of medical communities to help alleviate that stress of getting a medical degree just to know how my own body works. Um, so yeah. yeah, that's huge. And I think, you know, in working with folks who, um, you know, are feeling just, you know, are looking to us for us to do advocacy on their behalf, right? Like, it's a struggle when we can't just do, just to do a hep C test right? <laughs> and um, to do an HIV test. And then it would eliminate, you know, some of the things that you were talking about, Deshae, about um, having to interpret all of these things. Like, why just, why not just do the test that needs to be done? And then we'll just have that result clear, you know, instead of having to interpret liver function, you know, <laughs> which, you know, is not, is not something most people can do. Um, and I think that, that we do need to think more clearly about the barriers, even in urban areas um, with transportation, um, looking at the overdose rate in a region and understanding that that means a lot of people are probably using. And so, you know, it doesn't really make sense that HIV and HCD rates would be low in that environment, right? It doesn't make sense for, for one factor related to drug use to be very high. And then just for some reason, HIV rates are just stagnant. There's, some, there's something amiss there. And I think that's the question that people on the ground keep asking is like, is this number really this low or are we just not doing testing? And I think what this webinar shows is we're not doing the testing. If we really were testing folks and we prioritize that and we wanted to know and we wanted to get people in treatment, um, then we would have much higher numbers. And, and that would be okay if we could respond appropriately. You know, but then we have to ask the question, is the money there for treatment and is the, is the will there to treat people and to care for people who do test positive for hep C and HIV? Jay, this is off topic, but it kind of speaks to what you were saying about like, we should never put the burden on patients to teach themselves. Um, and so often and what I have seen so much in my nursing career is how often the medical community burdens marginalized people to teach us. Um, 
doctors and nurses expect people who use drugs to teach them about what that means. We expect trans people to teach us what that, you know, what that means. And, and this is a failure of, of medical and nursing education too. Like this goes so deep, all of this. Uh, in nursing school, I can tell you that our conversation about hep C and HIV was less than 30 minutes long, and we never talked about marginalized people. Oh. Yeah, it's, there, there are a lot of access points that we all can can tap into, whether it be education, whether it be um, if you're working at a county health department and suggesting things to uh, your supervisors, um, if you work um, with a local organization and finding ways to maybe, you know, see if you can finagle in some confirmatory testing at least once a month um, for free, because that's expensive and it's stressful. Um, I mean, just looking up hep C testing I from what I was looking at in Durham like the if it's not free it's $75 and <laughs> $75 is a lot of money especially in Rona times so um yeah I, I really appreciated you all coming together um to talk to us about this and finding more ways that we let we, that we can plug into our community or plug into our local organizations um or plug into our local hospitals to advocate for people who do need the testing and who do need the um the treatment so thank you both so much for joining us today. And thank you all for, for joining us in this webinar. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Did anyone have any questions or comments before we wrapped it up? I hear typing. Yes. Oh, it's just me. Okay, well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Say, um, can um, I'm trying to find out what um, webinar Lee was talking about when he what he was introducing from the beginning. Okay, yeah, um, the uh, webinar on October first at ten a.m. for um, yes. changes on HMAP. Oh, changes on HMAP. Okay, thank you. Uh, Lee, did you want to talk more about that? Yeah, Thomas, we don't have a registration link yet, but it'll get made today and we'll send it out in the in the follow up. All right, thank you, sir. So yes, things coming out about our next webinar, which um, is supposed to be on October 1st, and as well as the conference registration that should be coming up really soon. So be on the lookout for that. Um, and thank you all so much for coming together to talk about this. If you have any questions, please feel free to email us. Um, if you have any ideas on little projects you'd like to do. I mean, this is the time of Rona and I got free time to make projects. I love making projects. So please just let's all connect together and see what we can, what we can do because we are greater together than we are by ourselves. Thank you, Deshae. Thanks everyone.